Joining me now in studio is Janka Ortal, a transatlantic fellow in the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Janka, thanks for staying around. Um, there have been huge expectations prior to this summit. We've seen several hours of Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. First, they had that historic handshake, and then they had a working lunch together. They signed a document. Has everything that we've seen today matched the expectations that we all had going into this? Yes, to a certain degree it has, um, because uh, the expectation was that they would meet. The expectations in the expert community were not necessarily that high. And also the expectations, I think, from the U.S. administration were not overly high. No one expected that Kim Jong-un would lay down and say, all of my nuclear weapons are yours, you can do whatever you want now. Uh, this is not the expectation. The expectation was that they would get to know each other. And this expectation has been met. Now, the hype and the circus around it, that's a different story. Uh, that's, I think, one that definitely plays to Trump's base. In terms of denuclearization, this is, of course, at the core of this discussion. Um, what is North Korea looking at when they say denuclearization? Because we know that the definition that the Americans are looking at is very, very different. For the North Koreans, denuclearization is just a step-by-step -step process. And this is what you can also read in the, in the declaration now that they've signed together, that they regard this as incremental steps, step-by-step, -step, that they could take. There's no word about it of being, it being verifiable or it being irreversible. So I think this is, it, it shows us clearly that they talk about denuclearization. When they talk about denuclearization, they mean the entire Korean peninsula. That's always the context in, that, in which they put it. And they mean the U.S. should back off. Of their, um, of their borders and of their security. So they feel encircled by U.S. Um, military presence in the region. And that would, for them, that's also denuclearization. Yanka, as we're speaking here, we'd just like to remind the viewers that we're looking at some live video of a press conference. You can see journalists, reporters gathered there. Some 3,000 have converged in Singapore for this historic summit. We're all waiting for U.S. President Donald Trump to emerge to that podium where you can see the U.S. president logo at the podium to speak and address and potentially take questions from reporters. We all have a lot of questions going into the summit, and we still do, because that document, you saw it a little bit earlier. Are there concrete policy plans in place, or is this more of a generic, nice to meet you, let's see what happens next? It's more the latter. Um, but it names Mike Pompeo in it as the lead person for the follow-up process. So it hands it back to the State Department, which is a good thing because we've seen the CIA in the lead at, at various points when Pompeo was still for the CIA. So putting this to the State Department means putting diplomats at play again, which is probably a good sign. Right, and in terms of Kim Jong-un, we were talking about this earlier, you mentioned the troops and security assurances. Yes. What kind of security assurances might he ask for? Troop withdrawal is definitely in the books. I mean, tr troop withdrawal is something that Kim Jong-un could sell at home easily. Um, it's something that the U.S. might be willing to give, at least a certain level of troop reduction. Um, it's a symbolic, a symbolic reduction maybe first. So there are a certain, there's wiggle room in this agreement, which is probably a good thing because it does allow for a process to start. Um, it, yeah, there, a lot of the things that have been said in the, in the agreement have been said before, but this is a different leader now. It's Kim Jong-un. He has another 35 years or so of leadership probably ahead of him if he stays in power. So something has to change inside North Korea, and he has to deliver. And so he might be more willing to give uh, than his predecessors, his father and his grandfather. In terms of what he's willing to give, do you think what happened in Libya with Muammar Gaddafi has made him a little bit gun shy perhaps in terms of trusting the Americans or other Western countries that removing de nuclear weapons from your country could potentially come back to haunt you? Yes, but I think all authoritarian leaders worldwide have kind of seen that as a bad example. Um, giving up your nuclear we weapons lately hasn't been such a good thing. So he will make that, of course, the last step in any kind of uh, negotiation that could come to place. But that was also something that was expected. None of the people watching this really closely were expecting that he would give up his nuclear weapons right now, right then, after 15 minutes in a room with Donald Trump. In terms of these two people being together in the same room, trust. Of course, the Libyan example has probably caused a lot of distrust in terms of Kim Jong-un and how he views this entire situation. Does he trust the Americans? No, I don't think so but he doesn't need to at this point in time. He needs to serve his interests. He needs to fulfill his agenda. He has something that he wants to achieve and that he wants to get out of this meeting. And Donald Trump is an essential part of this, but he doesn't need Donald Trump's, he doesn't need to trust Donald Trump. On the other hand, one could say he might need Donald Trump's trust. Um, so he might need Donald Trump to trust him a little bit. Um, and that's something that he might be able to stage.
Um, but I'm not a big fan of the trust discussion between the two at this point in time. It can easily be said at this point, and, and, and Donald Trump will talk about this trust being established by being five minutes in the room, but trust is something that needs to grow. Yeah, something that needs to grow, that takes time to build and perhaps a second to demolish. Just to remind our viewers, you're looking at live pictures on the other side of the screen there of reporters gathering to waiting for U.S. President Donald Trump to make an appearance, to give a statement perhaps, and even potentially answer some questions from reporters in the room, questions that not only reporters, but people watching around the world have this hour. Yanka, I'm going to come back to you. There were North Korean flags and American flags. We see that in this picture here, flying side by side. They've been hoisted side by side. Has Trump given legitimacy to not only Kim Jong-un, but his regime? Yes, he has. And, and I've uh, watched a little bit of what happened on social media. There have been some conversations about this uh, diminishing the value of the American flag being next to a totalitarian flag like this. And I think this is also very important for the conversation that we're having at the moment. We were talking about trust earlier and about legitimacy earlier. This is something that Kim Jong-un can show. He can show the way he treats his own population, whether he is trustworthy, whether he is willing and able to provide a prosperous future for 25 million North Koreans that are currently suffering under his repressive regime. Could human rights be something that the Americans, maybe not today, because perhaps today is not the day to bring this up, but human rights is an issue that observers around the world are touting, I've been holding on to. Is this something that the Americans could potentially bring up at a later point in discussions to probably push him to make some changes within his own country for the millions of North Koreans who are suffering? And I would say human rights is an issue that you should always bring up. And it's not an issue to be postponed for later. Um, I would have wished that this would be in the declaration because this is something that um, is important for the overall understanding of the situation. And it is not just a geopolitical situation to deal with. These are 25 million North Koreans that are affected by this. And making North Korea an object of international relations, a little black box that you can deal with via Kim Jong-un is not necessarily helpful. I think this is a part where the Europeans have always played a role and said we should not um, dehumanize North Korea. North Korea needs a face as well. It has people that are living there. It has people that want to make a living there and that are increasingly open to information that's coming in from the outside and are able to make um, more informed choices maybe in the future. Yanka Ortel a fellow with the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Thank you.